All right, so the Kingdom Parables, that's the name of the series. We're in lesson number five. We're going to do the parable of the hidden treasure, uh, the parable of the pearl, and the parable of the debt. Three parables today we're going to cover. Uh, by way of review, always, just a, about a minute or so, remind us of what we're talking about here. We said that parables are lessons that use physical things and situations in the material world in order to explain or to mirror principles and situations that exist in the spiritual or the unseen world. Pretty much a common definition of what a parable is. Uh, we know that Jesus spoke many parables and the theme of a great many of these was the uh, kingdom of heaven or the, the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, 13 out of 43 parables talk about that, so that's why we're studying those in this series. And some of the things that we have learned about the kingdom from the parables so far. Number one, the kingdom exists wherever God rules His servants. Wherever God rules, the kingdom uh, exists. God and His servants together. Uh, we also said that at the moment the kingdom exists in two dimensions. The kingdom of heaven in heaven, where God rules with His angels and the saints, the martyrs. And the kingdom of heaven on earth, where He rules with His people, we call that the church. And so we've also learned that the kingdom of God on earth is really the church. So when, we're talk, when Jesus is talking about the kingdom, He's talking about the church here on earth. Uh, another thing that we've learned, at the end of the world, when Jesus returns, both dimensions will be joined into one. There will be a merge. The, you know, the kingdom in heaven, in heaven, the kingdom of heaven on earth will come together into one unit. A couple of other things. The parables of the kingdom actually describe the state of the kingdom here on earth and also its development until fully formed and ready to merge with the heavenly kingdom. So you know, that's why we say the church is not perfect. You know, it, it, we're still growing. Well, that's the idea. It's growing and maturing and to the point when it'll be ready uh, to join with the kingdom that exists already in heaven. And as far as the kingdom on earth is concerned, Jesus' parables have taught us that First, the kingdom of heaven here on earth affects the rest of the world, right? He says it in different ways, that we should be the salt, that we should be the light, right? We affect, we, we, we have an impact on the world around us. Also, the kingdom of heaven on earth has both sincere and insincere people who claim to be in it. However, Jesus will purify the kingdom before the one below is joined to the one above. That's always a big surprise. Always a kind of a, a shock to the system when we realize that God knew and told us in advance that in the kingdom of heaven there would be you know, the sincere and the insincere and they would kind of you know, be side by side inside the kingdom. Because a lot of people assume that everyone in the kingdom belongs in the kingdom, will be okay in the kingdom, and then we have a hard time understanding why we see some people in the kingdom that are such hypocrites, that are so weak, that are so you know, non-Christian. And we wonder, well, what are they doing here? Well, Jesus talks about that. He says, don't worry about that. Don't get all upset if you, if you see that the, you know, it doesn't seem that everybody who's in the kingdom at the moment wants to be here or acting like they should be here. He just tells us, you just be patient. You know, at the end, we, we'll do the separation. And we have, we've already talked about parables that tell that exact story. Uh, also, the kingdom is open to all who enter in based on God's invitation and condition. And those who are the genuine citizens of the kingdom are faithful to Jesus and bear good fruit of holy lives and service to God and man. But it's not us to decide that. We don't get to decide, you know, oh, you're fruitful, you're not fruitful enough. You know, and we don't get to decide because we don't know all the facts. Only God knows all the facts. Only God knows the heart of the person. Only God knows the tortured and twisted road that that person may have had to take to get into the kingdom. Okay. Uh, so today we're going to add a few more ideas to this mix as we study the parables concerning money. 
So hidden treasure, pearls, and the debt. So let's begin reading. Uh, Matthew chapter 13 uh, in verse 44 to 46. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid again. And from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Jesus continues, he says again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. So here again, the stories are obvious. They're easy to understand. In the first one, the parable of the treasure, the man uh, working in a field is probably a hired worker or someone who is subcontracting the land for farming or perhaps someone assessing the land for purchase. He finds a treasure by accident. It is so precious that he sells everything he has in order to buy the field and become the legal owner of the treasure. Notice he doesn't steal the treasure, he doesn't take and run away with it. He's an honorable man. He, you know, he wants to own it, but he wants to own it legally. In the second parable, the parable of the pearl, the person is a merchant who is deliberately seeking pearls. He didn't find the pearl by accident. He was looking for pearls. Like all precious jewelry, it requires knowledge and training to spot and evaluate the true value of these items, especially pearls. In his search, he finds not only a good pearl, but one of such exceptional beauty and value that he sells all that he has in order to own that one pearl of great price. So these stories are basically the same, except one person finds a treasure by accident, and the other is actually looking for the treasure, okay? However, both find treasures, both give up all they have in order to possess the treasure that they have found. Again, simple stories, happy endings, happy endings for both. But for those who were listening with an ear to understand about the kingdom, because Jesus said in the beginning of both of these stories, the kingdom of heaven is like, these people learned a few more facts concerning the kingdom. Remember I said pieces to the puzzle? Well, they added a couple of extra pieces to the puzzle you know, based on these two uh, parables. A couple of things they learned. One, it is not obvious to everyone. Not everyone sees the kingdom. Sometimes you find it without expecting to find it. You know, like the person who found the treasure, Sometimes you find you know, the church by accident. By, by, you weren't looking for the thing. You were doing something else. Maybe somebody shared the gospel with you. <clears throat> or you visit a church service just to be polite to someone else. Or because your new girlfriend you know, invites you to church. Or in a moment of difficulty, you call out to God, the God you know, that you don't know very well. That was a lot my case. You know, my case, and not going into too long a story, but I remember making the prayer, I know you're there. Uh, you're there somewhere. Let me know who you are. I'm looking for you, but I don't know who you are. That was kind of my prayer, I was saying. I, you know, I was so confused because there was so much, quote, religion around. And, and I was going, but this religion stuff, it can't just be that that represents you. Of course, what I was looking for was this. <laughs> this is what I was looking for, but I didn't know it. I didn't know where to find him. Okay? And so I'm like that guy. You know? I wasn't looking for the pearl. I was saying, I, I was wandering around. Or you read the Bible, for example, or some other book, and, and it leads you to Christ. Sometimes you go through a long period of searching, like the person who was looking for the pearl. You go from one church to the other. How many people have come here, I know, saying, well, I tried this church. You know, I decided I want to go back to God, but I don't, I've been across the street and I've been to the, that church and this church and I'm trying, you know, they're looking. Or they spend time praying to God to lead them. Or they read books or they talk to people about religion or spiritual things, looking for the truth, looking for something that resonates, you know, something that they can kind of latch on to, like the guy looking for the pearl. 
So the kingdom is there, but most people are oblivious to it. Why do I say that? Well, read any newspaper from A to Z. Will you find a mention at all of the kingdom in any newspaper, in any place in the world? Listen to the broadcast news and listen to every single broadcast news from any country <laughs> and see if they talk about the kingdom. They don't, oblivious to it. You know, they see a field, but they don't see the treasure. They see clams, not the pearls. They see religion, they see church buildings, but they don't see the living Christ. Okay? So what do we learn about these two parables? Well, we learn it's not obvious to everyone. Another thing we learn about the kingdom from the parable, the two parables, one of the uh, hidden treasure, the other one of the pearl, it's worth everything that you have. Note that both persons had to liquidate everything they had in order to possess the treasure, you know, to buy the land so they could have the treasure. Or for the pearl merchant to have that one particular pearl, had to sell everything he had. However, they did it in order to become wealthier than they already were. The kingdom is like that. In order to enter in, you need to leave everything behind, so to speak. You know, things like your former beliefs. You leave those things behind for exclusive faith in Jesus Christ. You, you, you know, in some countries and in some religions, you can add Christianity to your existing religion. You know, he, he becomes just one more God. You know, okay, now we've got 15 gods. You know, one more God, you know, it can't hurt. <laughs> Christianity is not like that. You can't add another religion to Christianity. Christianity is exclusive. You leave your former, many of your former goals and dreams for the goal of heaven and righteousness. Doesn't mean you don't have, you're not motivated in life perhaps to excellence, to, to grow in your work or to grow your business or to, you know, uh, no. Christianity doesn't ask you to become less or mediocre. But you do change your ultimate goals. My ultimate goal is to go to heaven and I won't let anything in my work, for example, or in my hobbies that will take me away from that goal. So you do change your ultimate goals. Um, you leave behind, for sure, your sins, your worldly pleasures in order to maintain fellowship with the Holy Spirit. However, whatever you leave behind, whether it be good or bad, the Lord will bless you 100 times over in the kingdom. In our case, it was very much our family. You know, our family just didn't get what we were all about here. They just didn't understand about the Bible. They wouldn't read the Bible. They wouldn't look at the Bible. They wouldn't, even when I was on television and had a, you know, a network television program teaching the Bible throughout the entire province of Quebec, a lot of people watched that program except one group, my family and Lisa's family. They wouldn't even watch the show just for the novelty of seeing their son or their son-in-law on television, on network television. Even that was not enough to move them to open and just listen to the Bible. Now that doesn't mean we never spoke to our parents again or never spoke to, no, of course not. We went to birthdays and you know, Christmas, dinner, and things like that, but it was never the same after we became Christians and after we began to grow in our faith and our commitment and I went into ministry, boy, that just, that even opened the divide even wider. But, however, in our Christian faith, you know, talk about a hundred, well, we've made more than a hundred people our brothers and sisters. You know, in, in any, almost any major city in Canada, I can go and I, I can just pick up the phone and call somebody and say, hey, I'm in town, you know, come on over. You, know, you need a place to sleep or you need a meal. Or, you know, so we've been blessed a hundred times over with, quote, our church family. So it's worth everything it's worth everything you leave behind. The kingdom provides peace and joy, confidence and salvation, freedom from death and condemnation, 
and most importantly, the sweet experience of knowing and serving the Lord Himself. So the kingdom is not obvious to everyone, but if you find it, it's worth giving up your life in order to possess it. So there's a couple of things we learn uh, from these uh, two very short parables. So now we move on to another parable. This is the parable of the debt. If you're following along in your Bibles, that's Matthew chapter 18. This parable was spoken at a time when the apostles were keenly interested in the life within the kingdom. They were grappling with Jesus' teaching about the kingdom, and for the most part, they believed that the kingdom that Jesus spoke of was to be some type of earthly domain. They were still under that impression as he was explaining the nature of the kingdom through these parables. So their thinking matched the common hope that the Messiah would usher in you know, this golden period of power and prosperity for the entire Jewish nation. They were Jews and they thought like Jews. So up to this point, the apostles saw themselves as like co-rulers you know, with Christ in some kind of earthly kingdom that resembled the worldly kingdoms that existed at that time. They still really didn't get it. This is why a little before this parable is spoken, they ask Jesus who among them would be the greatest in his kingdom. That question alone demonstrated that they did not understand the nature of the kingdom of, of God. Why? Because what they were desiring was position. What position am I going to have? Who's going to be higher or lower than me? Well, that's, if you know anything about the church, you know, that, you know it doesn't work that way. Of course, Jesus answers them how? By saying that the greatest in the kingdom are going to be the least in the kingdom, those who are like children. After this, the Lord explains to them that another characteristic of those who are in His kingdom uh, is that uh, they have the ability to forgive and the need to maintain unity by being reconciled to brothers that they offend or who offend them. So at this point, you know, understand now, I'm telling the story that leads up to this, to this parable. You know. So they, they want to know who's the greatest and who's up and who's down. And Jesus says, well, you have to be like a child and you have to be able to forgive and you have to be merciful to one another. And, and so Peter at this point, wishing to show that he is leadership material for the kingdom, asks his question about forgiveness, which sets the stage for this parable. So we look at uh, the question is, you know, who is the greatest in the kingdom? So we go to 18, verse 21 and 22. It says, Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Now we need to understand that in Jewish culture, the maximum times you needed to forgive if asked was three times. That was the law, three times. You had to forgive three times if you were asked. So Peter, wanting to show that he was good material you know, for leadership in the kingdom, says, well, I'm prepared to go past that. How about seven times? Not three, not four, not six. How about seven times? And so Jesus responds that forgiving a limited or set number of times is forgiveness according to rules, according to law. He then says that, it, he doesn't say in the kingdom, but in brackets, you know, understood, okay, between the lines. In the kingdom, forgiveness is a natural characteristic. You're just like that, okay? Seventy times seven actually means infinitely, like it's a character trait, it's part of you. As many times as required, as much forgiveness as is needed, this is how much forgiveness you offer. Because sometimes the forgiveness needed is for a small offense, and then sometimes it's for a great offense, like you know, someone I don't know, knocks over your glass of water onto your nice uh, dress or something and, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, oh my God. That's okay, don't worry about it. You know, 
forgiveness for a small matter? Or how about forgive if your spouse is unfaithful? Now that's not just spilt water. That's a big thing, right? As much forgiveness as is needed to cover the offense. I have enough forgiveness to cover spilt milk. I have enough forgiveness to cover a terrible offense against me. 70 times seven not only repeated forgiveness, but also the amount of forgiveness, as much as is needed. Okay. So Jesus then gives the parable to demonstrate the magnitude of forgiveness available in the kingdom and the attitude each needs to have to be considered a citizen of the kingdom. So we keep reading verse 23. He says, for this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And so a slave in a high stewardship position has made bad investments and lost his master's money in some way. The amount, of course, is staggering. I mean, 10,000 talents, I mean, that's like millions of dollars today, all right? So to get the, the amount right here. So we continue reading. But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and children, and all that he had, and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion, and released him, and forgave him the debt. So the Lord had complete power over this slave, or steward, and the judgment was fair since he had entrusted him with a fortune. And this person had lost his fortune. So the man pleads to have a chance to repay, which actually was impossible. <laughs> that was impossible. He was a slave. How, how was he going to repay? There's no way he could repay. He was simply asking for mercy, complete mercy. The master, feeling compassion, goes one step further. He doesn't just say, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're actually going to sell your wife and children so I can get some money and I'm going to put you to work over here you know, and I'm going to take 80% of your pay for the next 200 years. You know, he doesn't make any conditions. Complete forgiveness. All right, it's good. The debt is paid. You go back to where you, you, go back to where you were. He forgives him the debt. And that's what forgiveness means. The debt is paid off. You don't owe me that. 10,000 talent anymore. That's what forgiveness is. It's not forgiveness if he says, okay, you're not going to be in jail, but you owe me that money. You still owe me. And I will remind you that you owe me every time I see you. So whenever the, you know, the slave walks by and the king will say, yeah, here's the guy who owes me 10,000 talents. You know, here's this guy over here. Don't lend him any money. You know what happened with me? This guy blew my fortune. You know, that's not forgiveness. You know what they say? You bury the hatchet, but you leave the handle sticking out of the ground you know, so you can find it again. Well, it's something, something like that. Uh, and, and I want you to note that he also returns the slave to his former position of responsibility because with forgiveness comes restoration. You know, God doesn't just forgive you, but then adds more punishment. If He forgives you, you're forgiven. He restores you afterwards. So we read on. It says, uh, but uh, that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. So this fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should, until he should pay back uh, what he owed. So the same scenario repeats itself, but this time another slave who owes him 100, you know, 20 bucks, 100 denarii, 20 dollars. He asks the former slave the same thing, of course, Jesus repeats the same words you know, to kind of you know, make his point, if you wish. But of course, the pleas fall on deaf ears and the slave is cast into prison by the former slave who had been forgiven. 
we finish it off here. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed to him. So this conduct is reported to the master who rebukes his unforgiving servant for being so hard hearted, hard like a stone, especially after having received you know, such mercy him, himself from the master for a, an unpayable debt. This time he's put in prison, he's tortured until all is repaid. In other words, a life sentence. He gets a life sentence. Verse 35, final verse. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you, each of you, uh, if each of you does not forgive his brother in your heart. So Jesus now speaks directly to his disciples in summarizing the parable by warning them that if their forgiveness is not sincere for their brethren, he even makes it very specific, they also who have been forgiven by God will receive punishment that they originally escaped uh, and deserved. So again, a couple of things that we learn about the kingdom in this parable. Number one, offenses are possible in the kingdom. The kingdom as it exists here on earth in the form of the church has not yet been perfected in glory and so there is still the problems caused by sin. It's like a marriage. Two people come before God with all sincerity, they're Christians, and I say to God, you know, please bless our marriage, we're married, you know, we're focused, we're, uh, you know, we're going to be together, we promise for life, we're going to do it right. You know? And then life starts. As a you know, I tell married people, you can't put two sinners together, committed to live together for their whole life, and there not be trouble. <laughs> and there not be differences, wrinkles. Well, imagine, take 400 people and put them together in a relationship, brother and sister in Christ. Put 400 people and put them together in a relationship and get them to work together, building and serving and doing stuff. Don't you think there are going to be some trouble there? Of course. So people offend and hurt each other intentionally or by mistake. Some hurts are huge and others are small, but either way, someone is hurt and someone has to make it right. People who are offended and discouraged or criticize the church because it is imperfect and because there is sin, those people need to understand that there will always be sin. There'll always be hurt in the church because it's filled with sinners who are in the process of becoming saintly. But sometimes that process is slow. Jesus acknowledges that from time to time we will be in debt to each other for various things. So, one lesson about the kingdom. Offenses are possible, probable, even in the kingdom. Secondly, well, mercy is the answer. In the world, we look for justice, fairness, compensation, to take care of offenses and mistakes. That's what lawyers are for. Yeah, we all hate lawyers until we need one. <laughs> then we don't hate them so much. <laughs> In the kingdom, mercy is the solution. That's the point. And response to offenses and mistakes is mercy, not justice, not restitution. I'm not saying there can't be a sense of justice. Somebody you know, borrows your lawnmower and breaks it and they apologize and I'm sorry and that was your favorite lawnmower or whatever. You know, and they say, look, I'm, I'm going to make it right. Let's go to Lowe's. Let's get you another one. You know, uh, well, there's the inconvenience and there's you know, whatever. But there has to be some mercy there. The reason for this is because it was God's mercy that allowed us entry into the kingdom in the first place, not justice. It wasn't His justice that enabled us to come into the kingdom. It wasn't His fairness. <laughs> it was His mercy that allowed us to come in. 
I mean, the justice and the restitution, that was done on the cross. That's where that is. And we're here because of mercy, all of us. So God so loved us that He gave up His Son Jesus on the cross so He could offer us forgiveness for every sin, great and small, and welcome us into His kingdom based on mercy. And so the point is, if you're here on mercy, well then you've got to you know, be merciful yourself, which is you know, the third point. Mercy is our guarantee. God's mercy guaranteed us a place in the kingdom. God's mercy guarantees us that we will keep our place in His kingdom. I, you know, I'm in the kingdom not because I've managed to, over the last uh, nearly 40 years, get it all right. I'm here because 40 years later, God is still having mercy on me. That's why I'm here. However, if we don't show mercy to our brethren for their offenses against us, then our lack of mercy will guarantee that we will lose our place in the kingdom. You can be sitting in the pew, it doesn't mean you're in the kingdom. So God's mercy and our mercy gets us in and keeps us in, and lack of mercy towards others will get us out and keep us out. That's also a strong lesson. I, I, I think I mentioned that last week uh, or the week before. We think, oh, we're going to study the parables. Oh, they're so cute, those. <laughs> Until you actually start studying them and you realize, wow, there's a pretty powerful message there. So the Lord adds more pieces to this puzzle about the kingdom with these few parables. One, the kingdom is not easy to find, but once you found it, you have found it, it's worth everything you have. That's one piece of the puzzle. Another piece of the puzzle. Those in the kingdom are rich in spiritual treasure. Spiritual treasure. We don't become more wealthy, obviously, because we become Christians. Some do, some, some do, because in leaving off their former ways, their former sins, if you wish, enables them to be more successful in whatever, their work, their studies, their married life, so yeah. But that's not why we desire to enter into the kingdom. It's the spiritual treasure that we find here. The other piece, mercy guarantees your place and your growth in the kingdom. There are growing pains in the kingdom and the basic virtue that guarantees your place and your growth is mercy because it reflects perfectly God's nature and involvement in your own life. How do I see the face of God in you? Your mercy towards me. I see His face in your mercy towards me. And you see His face in me because of my mercy towards you. Not just that, mind you, hopefully a pure character, a, a willingness to serve, all those type of things, but certainly one of his most dynamic and impacting virtues, as far as we are concerned, is his mercy. Okay? So we have a, you know, a building here in Choctaw that is, you know, it's functional, it's comfortable, it's pleasing to the eye, but if people who come here do not find the church pleasing to their hearts, as well as their eyes, they won't stay. You know, we, we often talk about improving it, and we do. You know, we got to get the carpets cleaned, and there's talk now about expanding some parking because you know, we have more and more people coming, so there's nowhere to put all the vehicles when everyone's here, that's fine. There's even some discussion about expanding somehow, we don't know how yet, but perhaps you know, building a multi-purpose room where we could have more classrooms and a, a larger space to do uh, all church events. You know, there's only about room for about 100 people in this room, but we've got 400 people to come. Where do we, where do we go if we want to do something all together? So that's fine, that's good. That's just the sign of a growing congregation. But if we can't match that kind of growth with the growth, you know, the inward spiritual growth, that's not what gets, people may come here you know, and examine the situation because they see the 
the outward trappings of growth, but they only stay because of the people. You know, the gospel is what brings them in, it is love that keeps them here. Okay? That's, that's important. Um, a church that is pleasing to the heart is a church full of mercy and kindness for those who have made big mistakes in life and those who even offend us but receive our mercy nevertheless. So let's not forget to build this up as well so that God will be glorified not only with the building but by the love and the mercy that exists within the building. That's why that sign is up on 23rd Avenue, 25 feet across and 12 feet high. Uh, the billboard that's on 23rd, this is, this is exactly what's there. So somebody's driving up 23rd, you know, going, would it be west? Yeah, going, uh, going west. You know, <laughs> and over there to the left where the autoplex is, there they look up and they see this thing 25 foot across that says, sinners! <laughs> And they, well, that gets your attention. And then they look down and it says, you're welcome at the Choctaw Church of Christ. Why? Because that's all we have here. We don't have any other type of person. Everyone that's here is a sinner. And we hope that people get that idea when they see this particular sign. The other thing that's interesting or ironic is that the sign is right above and next to the police station. So I don't know. What they, will, uh, what they will concur from, from that uh, placement. And then our old sign, you know, the Choctaw Church of Christ, uh, if you're heading east, just a street over, if you're, heading, you know, if, you're getting, if you're going west on 23rd, you see this sign. If you're heading east on 23rd, you see our older sign that just says, you know, Choctaw Church of Christ, speaking the truth in love, you know, which is fine. But that sign is right next to a bar. So I, <laughs> I guess people must be getting an impression that uh, we, uh, we chose these spots on purpose, but we didn't. Those were the two signs that were actually available. All right, so those are those three parables. Hope we get something out of that. and We'll just keep on going um, until we uh, finish this series. So thank you for your attention and we'll keep going next time.